Okay, uh, Biology of Fishes, the 4th of September, 2012. I um, want to continue today talking about um, the environmental conditions under which fish live and uh, some of the special properties of water relative to the air, which is our medium. Um, today is a Tuesday, and uh, it's also the first day of lab. Those of us who are local will meet uh, in the live session this afternoon at 2. And the lab officially lasts from 2 to 5.45, although we almost never uh, go that late. Um, you may have to individually work uh, later or at another time to get things finished up sometime. This first day, though, by design is uh, short and sweet. You know, I don't want to get anybody off feeling like they're overworked right in the first uh, lab. Um, I will have some more things to say about um, the technology. I, at this point, I hope all the folks who are not here in the room, at least, have uh, gotten the Camtasia AVI playbacks to work. They're able to get to the archive and download stuff. <clears throat> to get that codec to work, they've, they've already installed a little, uh, or to get Camtasia AVIs to play back, they've already installed a little codec, the TSSC codec. Um, we're still searching for um, a player that works with AVIs on Windows 7 to allow faster than normal playback. But so far, Ray, we have not been successful in finding the perfect match, it sounds. So we'll keep trying, though. Maybe something will pop up. Uh, so let me uh, zip down here to the point where we stopped last time. And that was uh, a first introduction to a Stella model. Uh, this little sal.stm model. And you can find a copy of that on the server, uh, on the archive page, that you can download and you can take it away, save it, you can work with it, play with it, do whatever you like. If you improve it, uh, I'd like to know about it. You know, if you feel like you've got a... We had some sort of technology collapse here, but maybe not too serious, I hope. Um... Anyhow, um, you know I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, giving you these little models and, and working with you on them. And if you find things that we all need to know, I'd appreciate it if you'd step up and say so. Uh, another uh, point to be made at this stage is that I have been accumulating input from some of you relative to uh, the introductions that I asked you to prepare if you were in the mood to do so. And I've gotten the ones that are in hand assembled, and I'll try to play those back uh, at the beginning of the lab session this afternoon and record them, capture them, and put them into the record. Uh, I'm waiting for Donovan to give me a little spiel, and he, he had uh, some trouble with his sound equipment, so he's going to try to come in and do it on this machine between uh, lecture and lab. So first thing in lab, we'll do that. It won't take long. I don't have that many. Um, um, so I, the last thing we did, I think, was explore that, that salinity model that uh, is designed to account for the tendencies of salinity to vary along uh, a coastline like Texas as a function of relative rates of rainfall or precipitation and evaporation and river inflow and dissolved solids in the inflowing freshwater, quote unquote, it's not always that fresh, and mixing between the bay and the ocean. And it works pretty well, you know, conceptually. You could quibble about the specifics, but I think conceptually it's, it's a reasonably good approach. And it's a good way to introduce you to Stella as the simulation model that basically models inputs and outputs to achieve a mass balance or a balance of something. Not always mass. Sometimes it's uh, something else. So that's the situation for seawater. Um, the situation for freshwater, 
of course, is that there's a lot less total dissolved solids in it than there is in seawater as opposed to that 32, 33, 34 parts per thousand total dissolved solids in normal seawater. Uh, there's, you know, um, you, have to, you have to scale to parts per million to get good numbers, you know, easy to work with numbers. So median total dissolved solids in freshwater uh, worldwide, larger bodies of freshwater at least, is about 170 parts per million or 0 0.170 parts per thousand versus 34 or 35. And a part per million is the same as a, you know, a milligram per liter. I guess you could get in and quibble on a molecular level, but we won't. Uh, parts per million because milligram is a thousand milligrams in a gram, and there's a thousand grams in a liter if you're talking water. So most folks consider that that's an equivalency. The range is a lot more as a percentage of the mean or the median because fresh water you know varies from almost distilled um, rainwater basically or water that's percolating through uh, minerals that don't dissolve very much uh, say uh, basaltic or silicon dioxide sand and uh, so those, those tend to be relatively low in total dissolved solids, you know. Um, 70 is sort of the lower end of that range. Uh, 70 parts per billion. 0 0.07 parts per million. Up to maybe 400. You go from East Texas uh, in the piney woods and uh, the silicon dioxide sandy soil. And the water is, um, is pretty low in total dissolved solids, low in alkalinity, low in everything except H2O, uh, relatively low in pH. And then you come over to the uh, hill country and you're dealing with uh, limestone, calcium carbonate, and that, some of that dissolves as the water uh, moves through it, so the total dissolved solids goes up. Uh, <clears throat> the tropical, you know, rainforests, the rivers there tend to be relatively low in total dissolved solids, pretty acidic. Um, so most fish that we keep in aquaria, we've got some folks in this class that like to do that, I find out. Um, a lot of those fishes, those tropical uh, fishes from uh, South America, I'm thinking about tetras, uh, for example, uh, in Cherisons, the cichlids, uh, they live at pretty low total dissolved solids. Um, if you live in the Brazos River or in one of the hill country streams, you may live at higher levels of total dissolved solids, whether you like it or not. The dominant inorganic, um, <coughs> dominant inorganic ions in freshwater tend to be bicarbonate, uh, that's HCO3 with a negative charge, sulfate with two negatives, and calcium with two positives. Waters are said to be hard if they have high calcium or magnesium. Uh, maybe a few other things, but not iron, for example. So on the test, don't tell me that water's hard because it's got a lot of iron in it. Um, one of the easiest and most reliable tests for hardness is the soap test. You know, if you put soap in the water and it forms a scum on your bathtub, then your water's probably pretty hard. I have the I have the slippery hair test that I learned when I was a kid growing up, and that is if you're taking a shower in soft water and you, you wash your hair, you know, your hair sort of feels kind of slippery. Still, like it's got soap. In fact, when I went away to college and, and dealt with relatively soft water for the first time, I kept thinking, you know, I can't get my hair, I can't get the soap out of my hair. Well, you know, I grew up with hard water and, and it feels kind of grippy, you know, when it's hard. The hair test. I don't know if anybody else talks about that. Probably not. 
Major ions, uh, here they are again in freshwater and the percent uh, contributions that they make on the average to the total. Uh, bicarbonate's the dominant thing. Um, and then sulfate and calcium, strontium together, 17%. Um, there's other stuff there that's really important, you know, just because it's an important percentage of total dissolved solids doesn't mean it isn't important. I mean, for example, uh, in the important uh, uh, nutrients with the nitrogen and phosphorus, um, even though it may be almost uh, undetectable in solution, these can be very, are very important in terms of uh, the food chain and production. Photosynthesis on up. A lot of that uh, nitrogen and phosphorus tends to be bound up in, in the biomass of the organisms and so you don't see it when you do a test of what's in solution. Sometimes people tend to forget that. Uh, uh, dissolved solids pollution is a big problem. Uh, one of the major problems that we face along the coast of Texas these days has to do with the accumulation of salt in coastal waters. A uh, combination of uh, drying, dry weather, uh, drying times, and uh, reduced freshwater inflow that's partly due to the fact there isn't as much rain, but partly it's due to the fact that we're using more and more of the freshwater, uh, retaining it, uh, and then letting it evaporate and once it's evaporated, then it's gone. It's not going to be there to flow into the bays. Uh, may come back eventually, you know, as rain. You hope so. The water cycle says, you know, that the water goes downstream and some of it evaporates and some of it flows in as water. And then the part that evaporates finally condenses somewhere, sometime. And you get more rain to replenish the fresh water. The amount of water, you know... Uh, on a global basis, total H2O has been pretty pretty constant probably for a very long time. But, uh, you know, it's not always in the same places and it's not always with the same characteristics. And that makes for big problems. Um, toxic materials also are total dissolved solids. Uh, they contribute in a minor way, but in a major way in terms of impacts. Heavy metals, for example, uh, pesticides. And then a final point to be made is that the amount of total dissolved solids in water affects the density of the water. And the rule of thumb is about 0 0.001 grams per cubic centimeter increase in density for every part per thousand total dissolved solids. So I always like to pause at this point and say, now, wait a minute, let's do a little test here. What's the relative density of seawater to freshwater? Now you're supposed to think, wait a minute, 35 parts per thousand, 0 0.001 contribution from each part, so that's about 0 0.035, so 1.035, right? Well, that's not too far off. It's about 1.028 on a global basis. So... Um, salt contributes to density, and salt contributes, therefore, to buoyancy. Freshwater fishes and marine fishes have different volumes of swim bladders that are characteristic, and the reason is that they have to live in water that has different densities and, therefore, different buoyancies. You know, I, I like to point out, uh, maybe I've already said this, you know, it's hard to know if I said it this year or last year or the year before that. Uh, Ray remembers me saying that, you know, you don't think that salinity affects density of water and its buoyancy. Just crawl out of a, you know, a marine environment and jump into that freshwater pool and you feel like you're going to sink. Or you get into the Dead Sea and you only, you float standing with, you know, your waist up. You know, you don't have to tread water in the Dead Sea or in the Great Salt Lake for that matter. But that's marine water. We're talking here about something that's below the level of total dissolved solids in marine waters. But even there, there's an important role of salinity on density. 
think you want too many. Pardon? I think you want too many. Ah, probably so, because that doesn't look re relevant. I think my keyboard mount, my batteries may need replacement there. Actually, we've gone a little further than I wanted to go at this point. I think I went about six too many there. So I'm trying to think, was there something else I wanted to say about that? Uh, I think the thing I also wanted to say about this, and maybe i say it again later, is that total dissolved solids affects the density of water. So too does the temperature. And you can achieve you know, changes in density and neutral equivalency by adjusting relative temperature and salinity. In coastal waters, that can be important. And I like to give the example of how that can change the system in which fish have to operate. You know, normally if you discharge uh, heated effluent into a receiving body of water, the effluent is warmer and therefore it's lighter, it's lower in density and so it floats as a plume that spreads on the surface. But now if the effluent plume has enough salt in it, the increased density due to increased salinity offsets the um, reduction in density caused by heating and sometimes you get to a situation where the, input, the influent plume dives and spreads out along the bottom. And it turns out that fish like Menhaden don't understand that. They didn't evolve in a system like that. They do some what we call pr predictive thermoregulation. And evolutionarily, they've learned to predict that whenever it gets too hot, the way to get cooler is to go down. How do you think that works when you're swimming into the plume of the P.H. Robinson plant down on the Texas coast and for whatever reason the water that's being used to cool has a lot more salt in it than the, than the fresh water in the bay. Maybe you've had a you know, big rainfall event upstream and the, and the receiving water is relatively fresh compared to the water that's being used to cool, which is coming out of a slough someplace. Well, you know, the most uh, dramatic fish kills I've ever seen associated with steam electric power plants have occurred in those conditions where, for whatever reason, you know, this unusual combination of really warm but really salty water resulted in a lethal environment down deep relative to the environment up above. So when the surface is almost survivable at 35 or 36 degrees, the water down deep is 42 42 is deadly lethal very quickly. Have I told that story before in your hearing, Ray? He's trying to remember. Uh, I don't remember it. Yeah. Well, I don't always tell the same stories, you know, it's just whatever comes to mind. Gases, you know, are other, there's other stuff that dissolves in the water that's really important, of course. And, uh, there's this dynamic exchange of gases that are in the air with gases that are in the water. And uh, dry air uh, has a composition that normally is about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and only about 0.03% uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, Let's hope it doesn't get a lot higher than that, you know, because that's not good. Anyhow, the uh, normal balance in, uh, in uh, air-saturated water at uh, zero degrees centigrade and one atmosphere of pressure is 2, 1, and 0.05. Um, if I talked about air saturation and how to achieve it, you know, in water, it's, it's not easy to do, you know. Water is often coming to us one way or the other not uh, at steady state relative to the air that's exposed to it or that it's exposed to. For example, water coming out of springs is often, you know, depleted in oxygen and other gases. Uh, water coming out of, well, I guess I'll say this a little later on, water coming out of uh, steam electric power plants may be supersaturated with gases. 
Um, so if you take a real shallow layer of water in a shallow pan and you put a fan on it and blow that fan across it and you make up for evaporative losses uh, so you don't get too much increase in salt, if you do that a while, a good while, then you may achieve something close to steady state. Hard to get steady state by just shaking the, the glass of water or by putting an a, a, a air stone like an Aquarius would use in the, in the water. It's hard to achieve saturation in that, in that way. So that's the way it's done by people who are really interested in nailing down what is the steady state. And at the steady state, we've got about 2% nitrogen and 1% oxygen and 0.05% carbon dioxide. And you look at these numbers and it should occur to you something's going on here. You know, why is there twice as much nitrogen in the water but there's four times as much nitrogen in the air? And the reason is that the uh, solubility of oxygen is about twice what the solubility of nitrogen is. And if you look at the carbon dioxide, there's actually more in solution uh, than there is in the air. And the reason for that is that carbon dioxide is about 35 times more soluble than oxygen, about 70 times more soluble than nitrogen. Solubility is proportionate to, uh, within a gas, uh, the total pressure of that gas um, divided by the temperature of the gas and the salinity, or temperature of the, the system and, and salinity of the water. So who is that? Is that uh, Charles's Law or somebody? I think once you put the, the temperature and salinity in, I think it gets to be Charles Gay-Lussac or somebody instead of just Boyle's Law has to do with volumes. So solubility is proportional to uh, directly proportional to pressure and inversely proportional to temperature and salinity. I, I got this deja vu that I'm telling you wrong. What is the, what is, it's not, uh, I mean, that's Charles's law is still volume, temperature, pressure, right? And Boyle's law is just volume temperature, I think, or volume pressure. So I think maybe this is uh, Henry's law or, or uh, Bunsen's, you know, somebody's, somebody else's law. I didn't name the law. I guess that tells you that I, I don't think the labels are that important. It's the functional relationships that are important, and I should have maybe paid homage to the source. Ray's checking it out. He'll tell us here in a minute. But anyhow, I'm pretty confident that that's the true situation that if you want to figure out how much gas is in solution or how much of a given gas is in solution in a given medium of a liquid uh, gas in fresh water, oxygen in fresh water, then figure out how much the pressure is of the gas in the atmosphere that's exposed to that water and it's directly proportional to that. The more the pressure, the more gas and the higher the temperature, the less gas. And the higher the salinity. Pardon? I'll go with Henry. Henry's law. Okay. All of you knew that, but you just didn't want to say it right. Uh, so my, I think I need to change the batteries here before the lab. Um, how much oxygen at air saturation in one atmosphere? Well, there's a little table for you. Um, Good rules of thumb to remember there have to do with the fact that, of course, the amount of oxygen in solution at steady state is going to be higher in fresh water than in seawater because the salt decreases the solubility. And it's going to be uh, higher at low temperature than it is at high temperature because, because both that salinity and that, and that temperature are in the denominator. So, uh, you know, you should, as budding scientists, uh, aquatic ecologists, fisheries managers, aquaculturists, whatever, you should try to kind of keep the rough numbers in mind. That, hey, you know, if you're talking about fresh water at 10 degrees, you're talking about 11 parts per million oxygen in solution. Now, this is sterile conditions, you know, without a lot of stuff contributing more oxygen or taking away the oxygen that's there. Steady state. And at the other extreme, you know, 30 degrees and seawater, you're down to six. 
and my rule of thumb, and it's not a, it's not a completely reliable one, is that the difference between seawater and freshwater is about the same in terms of the amount of oxygen you get dissolved as as the difference between two temperatures 10 degrees apart. It's about two. You know, about two parts per million as you go up in temperature or up in salinity that you lose. And, you know, that's not quite right. I mean, yeah, 11 and 9, that's about two, going from 10 degrees to 20 degrees in fresh water. But, you know, by the time you get down into seawater, 20 to 30, it's only one, it's only 0.8. So, you know, my, my rule of thumb is not very reliable. Uh, what is reliable is this simulation model that I uh, used to just call DOSAT because it used to just be uh, DO, but now I've incorporated uh, CO2 and pH, and I'm going to bring that up and look at it with you. Um, yeah. So we're going to just get out of the PowerPoint show there for the time being. And uh, this time I'm going to try to bring up my web page in, I was going to bring it up in Chrome, but I guess I don't have Chrome on this computer. I'll just bring it up in Internet Explorer. The reason I want to bring it up in Chrome was to show you that Chrome knows that the ending is STM. And you don't have to do that change game with Chrome that you have to do with Internet Explorer. Okay, there's the model. It's there on the on the archive. You've already seen this one. Uh, PowerPoint show we're still into from last time. We didn't need a new one because we we didn't finish. Um, we got uh, uh, records from the last two days. Hopefully, we'll get one today here later. And so, remember the thing to do is to right-click, save the target, change the ending. Change it to all files. Whoops, that's not going to work, Bill. My keyboard is really about to go. I hope we can make it through. Let's see if I can get it closer there. May have to just stop and I've got some here on my cart. I'm just too lazy to put them in. Uh, I didn't know I needed them until we got in here and got started. Okay, there's that little that little Stella model. And this time, you know, because you're going to need to start to work. Uh, if you're not in this classroom in this lab, 110 Nagel, you're going to need to work with uh, Stella Nine because that's the demo that you can go ahead and download. And so I'm going to go ahead and open this one with uh, Stella 9 just to show you the difference in how it looks. I showed you Stella 6 or 7 the last time we were together. Yeah, it's a version 6 model. I already explained this lowest common denominator idea, uh, but it'll open just fine in Stella 9. And Stella 9, no matter whether you close the... Uh, graphs or not always opens them when you open the model which I think is a little bit frustrating so I'm going to go ahead and close that close that notice that it's uh, designed to look more like uh, more like what well you can't see it <laughs> in the room here because our so over here on the left hand side you can barely see it you know there are tabs equation model, map, and interface. And the map and model tabs correspond with the little globe and the chi-square that we talked about in Stellan 7. So here in the room, if you open this, you'll see it'll open up, uh, and it'll probably open up in the chi-square mode, meaning that this is not just a, a schematic conceptual model, but actually is one that's you know got all the stuff in it it needs to run. And uh, I've used this device that I use in EcoFish. I've got these um, 
these sectors uh, closed so that you know I, I reveal them as I need them to you, and don't I don't uh, confuse you or worry you with details you don't need to see. And right now we're not talking about pH and CO2. We'll get to that. We're talking about O2 at air saturation, and I think this model Ray Camps may have developed. Did you did you develop that Ray, or was it uh, one of my other students? I didn't work much. Okay, maybe it, well, you, you may have not done it in Stella. You may have done it in just pure math. I mean, here's the, here's the thing I'm thinking about is the Truesdale relationship from uh, the Journal of Applied Chemistry, which relates um, a rate constant to a cubic function of temperature. That's what it does, you know, and you can worry about that or not, but this is just a goodness of fit empirical thing. And uh, so what it does is take uh, temperature and salinity and do uh, basically the things that gave rise to that little chart I showed you in PowerPoint. You can also find a similar chart, or at least you once could find a similar chart on the back of a Yellow Springs instrument dissolved oxygen meter. You know, it would tell you the air saturation values of oxygen for different combinations of temperature and salinity. This I think it's handier because it's continuous. I mean, you can put any values you want to whatever decimal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue about the accuracy once you're past that whole integer value of temperature or salinity. And even there, it could be a little off. So uh, this says it's 6.21. Uh, I don't think that, you know, I'm not sure what it was. Um, well, let's see. Okay, it's, I've got this thing set for seawater. And I've got it set at 30 degrees. Maybe that's right. Yeah, I guess it is. And it says that the DO at air saturation, when I run the model, is 6.21. And I think you'll see 6.2 on your chart that I showed you. Okay, let me, let me say that all Stella's doing here is acting as a simple-minded, uh, very simple calculator. It's not acting as a simulation model because there are no, there are no uh, rectangles here that are state variables like the salinity was in the other model that I showed you. I mean, in fact, if you look at the run specs, which tell you the details, it says it runs one step from step zero, the initial conditions, to step one. And it, was just, it just solves the equations one time. It doesn't need to solve them multiple times because the result is not going to change. Now, if you put into the model a series of temperatures and salinities, then you would need to solve it multiple times, but then you'd be in trouble because every solution you get for every combination would be assuming a steady state. It wouldn't be a transient state. It wouldn't say that over an hour, if the salinity goes from 10 to 35, that the DO would shift to the new steady state value. It might or might not, depending on how well mixed and all these kinds of things. So that takes us from the idea of a steady state to a transient state. This, this is a steady state solution. And you only need one step to get there. But you can put in any values you want. For example, you know, suppose we got zero instead of Suppose we got fresh water. That probably won't work. That was letter O. Stella doesn't like letter O in place of zero any more than Excel would. And uh, now I have to run the model again. So at 7.53, this says, if you've got 30 degrees and no salinity in the water. So, you know... Um, this is maybe handy, maybe not, but when you open up this one, I think you'll find it a lot handier because these calculations tend to be a lot more complicated down here, and we'll, we'll get to those when we talk about CO2 and pH. So that's the way Stella 9 works. You know, in, inside here, it looks pretty much the same. There are a few things that, that don't look the same that we'll encounter as we go along. I'll talk about them. I think I'll minimize that. We might need it again yet today.
So um, you don't have air saturation in the water all the time. You don't have a steady state. There are some situations you can count on to give you below the values that are in the table or that are calculated by that little Stella calculator. Low DO situations, I call them. Any place where there's high biological or chemical oxygen demand in the water is likely to give you uh, lower than steady state values of DO when you go out and measure with your dissolved oxygen meter. Uh, below sewage outfalls, you know, because there's lots of organic matter and there's lots of decomposition going on and most of those processes are, are oxygen consuming, so uh, you end up with low DO, often almost zero. And in water that has a lot of um, algae, a lot of phytoplankton, or rooted aquatic vegetation for that matter, at night, when photosynthesis is not going on, all of those plants are consuming oxygen just like the animals that are in the water. And they're sucking it out of the water. And by the wee hours, you know, or daylight, you can have near zero conditions, particularly on a calm night when the water isn't being stirred by wind. Even on a cloudy day, you know, when it's calm and cloudy, uh, Oxygen can go down. The other situation, the other class of situations that lead to low dissolved oxygen in the water is low rates of resupply. In other words, even if you're not using much, if you're not putting any back to replace what you are using, then uh, on balance you have lower and lower DO. Stagnant waters below the euphotic zone in a lake or an ocean. The euphotic zone is the zone at the surface that's true light, that's what euphotic means, means really what there's enough sunlight coming down to give you a net uh, photosynthetic situation where you're going to get more oxygen produced than used. Below that depth, you know, it's dark, 24 hours a day. And so there isn't much uh, replenishment of oxygen because it's a long way from the surface, takes a long time for oxygen to move down by, by the movement of water, and it's not really by diffusion. I mean, it takes forever for things to move any distance by diffusion. I don't mean forever, but I mean a long time. Relative to the time it takes for things to be carried along by circulating water. We call that convection. So convection... Uh, movements of the water from the air-water interface downwards in the water column in the upper layer of the water, the, the epilimnion or the upper mixed layer, uh, that will keep uh, oxygen distributed. But as you go from that upper mixed layer through that, uh, hypo, through that uh, uh, thermocline, oxycline, that, that is the separation between the upper mixed layer and the lower layer, or between the epilimnion and the hypolimnion. Limnologists use the words epilimnion and hypolimnion. Most uh, marine people talk about an upper mixed layer and a lower mixed layer. So you go across that boundary into that lower mixed layer and you're not getting any, any oxygen coming down from the surface. And there is something down there using it. Maybe not a lot of something, but something's using it. And so, uh, after a while, there doesn't tend to be much oxygen in that water until it gets brought up into the nearer the surface. And then it gets re-oxygenated. It's often carrying a lot of nutrients, so then it really, things go nuts. You know, photosynthesis booms, and we have, you know, areas up upwelling like off the coasts of South America on the Pacific side where you get the uh, very productive upwelling areas. Uh, water covered with snow and ice is often uh, in the category of low DO supply. You know, the, the ice seals the, the, the seals the water from mixing. And when you put a layer of snow on top of that ice, um, that pretty much makes it dark underneath. Plus, there's no circulation because there's no ability for the wind to stir the water. And long about uh, March, after a whole winter of this, things can get pretty, 
pretty tough under there relative to oxygen deficiencies. And when the ice finally goes out in one of these northern glacial lakes, long in March, early April, if it's been a real bad winter, you may have a bunch of dead fish revealed when the ice goes out. We call that a winter kill. Uh, we have fish kills in Texas during the winter time. Uh, sometimes on the coast, lots of dead fish. But that's a cold kill. That's not a winter kill. There's a distinction, technically. I mean, the, the historic um, uh, I'm trying to get my word right here. Anyhow, the, the, the word has been reserved uh, to mean a kill caused by low oxygen that is uh, that is associated with um, a, a prolonged period of winter and snow and ice. That gives you a winter kill. Doesn't happen every year, you know, because sometimes it doesn't. The, the ice or the snow doesn't accumulate early enough to block the light, so you still get some, you know, you still get some photosynthesis going on. Um, and of course, the cold kills don't happen fortunately every year either. But, you know, they happen often enough in Texas waters, like 89, I think, 83. Uh, back in the 40s, there was a tremendous cold kill when the bays froze over. Uh, that's a cold kill. So, you know, sometimes you get supersaturation of dissolved oxygen in the water. And that's just the opposite conditions. Periods, uh, you know, on bright days in clear, stagnant, algae-rich water, the same water that may give you a low oxygen early in the morning may give you supersaturated oxygen in late afternoon, just before dark. A lot of photosynthetic activity going on because if the water's clear, the sun is bright, and there's lots of phytoplankton. Um, power plant outfall areas are places where you can get supersaturation, not just of oxygen, but all gases that are in air. And the reason is that in these steam electric power plants, uh, the way they normally work, uh, water that's taken in to, to cool the, the uh, to condense uh, the, the gas that goes through the turbine that causes the turbine to spin to generate the electricity, that cooling water if it's air saturated with gases when it comes into the plant, it's heated under pressure or heated under containment. And so when you increase the temperature by 20 degrees centigrade and the water starts out air saturated at 10 and then, then it comes out at 30, you can see what's going to happen under the rules that we, Henry's Law or whosoever it is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have more oxygen in it, more nitrogen too, unfortunately, than can be sustained uh, in solution. So it's going to come out supersaturated. Eventually, it'll, it'll come out of solution. But before it does, you can have some big problems, not because of the oxygen, but because of the nitrogen, gas bubble disease. You know, funny, I did my dissertation research on steam electric power plants and ecological effects and back in those days, um, the dogma was, hey, you know, uh, thermal pollution is really bad because it's not only going to cause high temperature, it's going to cause the water to be anoxic. Well, it doesn't turn out that way, you know. It turns out that the water that's coming out of a steam electric power plant is often supersaturated, unfortunately also with nitrogen. We tried to culture fish years ago in discharge canals from steam electric power plants down on the Texas coast, places like Cedar Bio. And the idea was, was obvious. The idea was we wanted to take advantage of the high temperature during the winter to grow the fish faster. And what we found out was that, yeah, maybe, but, you know, the trouble was that a lot of times they died of gas bubble disease. So it didn't work out so well. Um, Diel cycles are really important in terms of uh, DO and other gases, and that was how far I jumped ahead a while ago when I held my finger down. These are actual data supplied uh, by Dr. Robert Vega 
from the Marine Development Center down in Corpus Christi, a, a given pond 28, during the period uh, mid-June to mid-July of 2005. And you can clearly see a nice diel cycle in dissolved oxygen. By the way, this, these measurements are normally made at a depth of about half a meter in a pond that's maybe a meter to a meter and a half deep. I don't know how big this, this pond is, maybe a um, half, maybe an acre to two or three, a half hectare to, to a hectare size. And uh, what you can see there is a lot of variance in the dissolved oxygen concentration at any time of day because these are, you know, 30 different days superimposed. And you don't always have the same conditions from one day to the next. So you get different DOs here at 5 a.m. Um, the peak DO on average was over there around uh, 7 or 8 in the evening. And this is near the time of the longest day of the year. So it's still pretty light out. At, these are probably um, probably central daylight times. But you know the surprise, look at this. I forgot to put my control A back into effect when I re... Look at that. Look, look where the minimum DO is a lot of those days. I mean, I was shocked when I saw those data. Why? Because I would expect the minimum DO to occur, uh, you know, at dawn or just a little after before photosynthesis really gets going and, you know, starts to overwhelm the respiration that's going on all night. But that doesn't seem to be the case. You know, it's like 9 in the morning when the DO hit it, it hits its minimum. Daylight, the sun's been up a while at that point, you know, in June and July. So I don't know. See, you, you learn something when you look at real data. You learn that theory and logic don't always carry the day. I mean, if you don't have anything better to go on, go with theory and logic. But you better look at the data if you got them. Doesn't that strike you as odd, Ray, as a water guy? Yeah, what was the depth he was sort of taking you about? Ray Camps asked what was the depth, about a half a meter probably, you know, mid-depth, something for the pond. And usually in one location. So some of this might be wind, you know. Yeah, question? Could that have something to do with uh, particle density? Yeah. Say say your name again for me, please. Aldemar. Aldemar asks in the back row, and I would give him the microphone, but he's pretty far away. He he asks, wouldn't this have something to do with um, the level of phytoplankton. phytoplankton densities? And yeah, I'm sure it would. You know, and the amount of wind and. Uh, it, cloudy days and sunny days, you know, all these things would contribute to that variance. But the overall pattern here of these low DOs being, you know, mid-morning almost surprised me. So, uh, you know, what's going on here that, that accounts for the pattern, though, is by and large, during the dark phase, you've got uh, everybody is consuming oxygen. You know, the plants and the animals are using oxygen. And then during the light phase, the animals keep on using the oxygen, but the plants turn in and start producing it by photosynthesis. So that, that really is the thing that accounts for this, this temporal trend, it's, uh, this diel trend. You know, there could also be other things going on. For example, wind is typically greater during the daylight period at this time of year than at night, so there's more mixing. You can... One more comment. I, I don't see that that is uh, going into much supersaturation no. of oxygen. No. So I'm not seeing a lot of photosynthesis contribution to it, so I think well, I agree with you about it being the wind. Okay, so, so Ray Camps is, is observing that even at the um, peak over here at 7, uh, we're getting uh, uh, not a lot of oxygen in solution. But I haven't told you a couple of things. One is, what's the salinity? 
And probably the salinity in this pond at this time of year was like 50. And probably the temperature was in the low 30s. So, you know, that combination, we could go there and check that out, couldn't we? Shall we? Shall we waste time and do that? Um, Control T to get back here, Stella. So let's just suppose that, you know, instead of zero, it's 50. And that's running, about what it's running now. You know, remember that it's getting saltier and saltier. Salination, not desalination, but salination is a big problem on the coast because of dry conditions. And so it's 50 parts per thousand in some of those ponds right now. And it could have been then. Temperature, you know, uh, I'm going to say 30 might be on the low side. I'm going to go to about 32. So maybe it was supersaturated. 5.58 is the saturation value for DO at 50 parts per thousand and 32 degrees centigrade. It was running 7 in some of those days. So some of those days are undersaturated, maybe cloudy, maybe not much wind. Um, turbid water, you know, so maybe not a lot of photosynthesis. Maybe the euphotic zone is pretty shallow sometimes. So these are, you know, I don't know if we'll have a chance to play with it, but while we've got Ray Camps in the group, we may sometime work with another model that I've been working on. It's a dynamic model, not just steady state for these changes in, in water chemistry that go on over the course of the day, pH and CO2 and DO and all those things. We won't take the time to do it now. So uh, that brings us to CO2 and uh, its close, uh, um, close uh, cognate variable, I guess you'd say, pH in the water. Uh, free CO2. Uh, has a big range in natural waters. I, I say here from zero to 20 parts per million. Uh, but, you know, not all the CO2 is free. And uh, some of it is bound uh, pretty tightly um, to other stuff in one way or another. CO2 reacts chemically with the water itself, unlike oxygen. Um, unlike normal normal conditions for oxygen at least. And there's the classic relationship CO2 plus water um, combines to give you uh, carbonic acid and then typically one of the hydrogen ions dissociates and you get uh, bicarbonate ion which remember the dominant thing in fresh water. And then maybe you get a further dissociation of that second hydrogen ion and you end up with carbonate ion with two negative charges and another hydrogen ion. Uh, higher pHs favor the forward reaction. So under high pH conditions, everything moves to the right and you end up with uh, carbonate in solution. Under low pH conditions, maybe almost no carbonate or bicarbonate may all be in the form of carbon dioxide. Seawater tends to be relatively basic. And so in seawater, we tend to be on the right end of that relationship. The soft fresh waters that I talked about earlier, um, waters without much total dissolved solids and without much hardness tend to be on the other end of the range. And so we may end up with a lot of, most of the CO2 may be free in solution there. So that's a hand-drawn graph from long ago that I didn't bother to replace, but basically it shows you the proportions that occur in the different uh, spe chemical species there as we go from pH of 4 on the one extreme to uh, some higher pH. I didn't say what over here, but there's 8.3. And at 8.3, most of the carbon dioxide is in the form of bicarbonate ion. And uh, at these pHs over near 4 and below, you get it all in the form of uh, free carbon dioxide. It uh, has some interesting consequences in that free carbon dioxide tends to be very lethal. 
um, if it's you know above a little bit sometimes and carbonate is pretty innocuous so you're not going to you know you're not going to kill fish with carbonate but you're going to often have some problems with keeping your fish alive at high levels of CO2 um, Here's how pH, CO2, and alkalinity are all interrelated. It's just of that simple equation there. Well, it doesn't look very simple to me, probably not to you either. I guess if you're really into physical chemistry, it makes perfect sense. What we're saying is pH is a function of alkalinity and carbon dioxide. And, um, but I, I got a way to save you some trouble there. You don't have to solve that. Um, in your head or with your calculator even. We can go back to our Stella model. And I've, I've done my best to uh, represent the math accurately there. And I think it's pretty good. But if you know anything about this, Ray and other folks, um, and you see an error or it doesn't give you a reasonable calculation of steady state values, I'd like to know about it. Until I... Somebody tells me it's wrong, I'm going to assume it's right. And so, you know, what this is saying is <clears throat> that um, all of these environmental variables affect um, this relationship involving pH and carbon dioxide. Um, some ones that uh, affect this that don't affect uh, oxygen solution or the alkalinity parts per million uh, measure are expressed as part per million uh, calcium carbonate and the partial pressure of air uh, air levels of carbon dioxide how much air is in how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and those of you who have been following the debate about global warming and co2 and greenhouse gases would be interested in how this what this has to say about pH of the oceans I guess 380 is about right for right now. That's about how many parts per million there is, you know, and that's up from what it was 100 years ago. It was more like 330 or 340. Some people are predicting levels as high as 1,000 in the next uh, century or so. Um, so what Stella does is convert the parts per million uh, CO2 into a pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere and takes the temperature and gets, gets it absolute by adding uh, 274 to the centigrade value. I guess that's what it's doing. 273 to get an absolute uh, Kelvin temperature. And here's the alkalinity molar equivalent parts per million calcium carbonate. Uh, the TA effect on the uh, rate constant, and I owe this to, I think, Todd Dart, <coughs> one of my current students, discovered this relationship. And um, so Stella can use a graph like that. You know, it solves the graph every time it executes a step and, and interpolates the linear uh, pieces for the relevant place in the graph. That's how it works. And so we, we go over here and we get pH out of the deal and we also get free CO2. So it might be fun for us to play some what-if games, you know. Um, let's, let's drop back on salinity to something more normal like seawater. Um, 32 would be a very high temperature in the open sea. 30 is probably uh, <coughs> near maximum. So let's go back to 30. Summertime in the open ocean. Um, Seawater tends to be more alkaline. Um, 150, you know, I think this is probably about right for coastal water. 150 parts per million alkalinity. And we got normal, normal atmospheric uh, CO2, so we'll just run that model that one step it takes, and we determine that pH under these conditions, 8.09, and uh, free CO2 in solution, 0.43.
So what happens if uh, CO2 goes to 1,000? pH is still on the basic side of neutral, which is 7. You know, pH is the uh, negative log 10 of a hydrogen ion concentration, I think. So 7 is neutral, and, and 14 is, everything is, that's about as basic as you can get. And 0 is about as ass as you can get. So we see pHs in these little ponds down in Corpus regularly on the order of um, 9, 10 even, late afternoon. The water feels pretty slippery when that pH gets to 10, almost greasy. CO2 is up to 1.14. You know, what if you didn't have as much alkalinity? What if uh, alkalinity drops to... You know, in a marine aquarium, and those of you who keep marine aquaria know that it's hard to keep uh, your alkalinity up. You know, uh, the activities there tend to take, you know, tend to make the water more basic or more acid, rather. And you have to use ground uh, coral or something to try to buffer it up. Uh, sodium bicarbonate. So if it went down to 20, Chris, we could be in a world of trouble, I think, here. Let's see. I'm trying to get it to run. Well, maybe not so bad. 6.79. Uh, So the thing that, that struck me about this relationship was that, you know, you really have to lose almost all your alkalinity before you're really going to get on the acid side there. Um, or you're going to have to have more CO2 than 1,000. Where would you get that? Well, you'd get that if you had a whole lot of respiratory activity of a big heavy load of fish. You know, and, and it can be more than a thousand in those situations. You might almost get, you might get something more like five thousand. Because you're not dealing with normal air there, you're dealing with the air, the atmosphere right around that water that these fish are living in. Valdemar. Okay. Um, say that again. Well, normally we do, and that's because the things that contribute to the production of CO2 are, are taking up the oxygen, but that wouldn't necessarily be the case. You know, if you can, you know, normally you're not going to have an atmosphere with 5,000 parts per million um, carbon dioxide and still have oxygen at what it normally would be in the normal atmosphere. So you're right there, I think. So anyway, we finally get on the acid side here pretty seriously, 5.4. Uh, and we're up to uh, 5.68, it looks like, on uh, parts per million um, uh, carbon dioxide in solution. And I'm trying to remember the combination of <coughs> conditions that you can use to get even worse scenarios. I have seen marine production systems with big biomasses of things like red drum that we we actually measured 30 and 40 parts per million carbon dioxide in the water and it and it turned out in that situation that the operator was having to use so much uh, sodium bicarbonate to try to keep the system buffered up that it, his second greatest cost behind liquid oxygen was sodium bicarbonate, and that was a head of feed. He was actually using more, spending more money on, on sodium bicarbonate than, than uh, feed. Well, take this thing, mess with it, see if you can put in your data, 
See if you can get it to give you results that you observe. That's always the test, right? Is what is the contrast between the, what the simulation says or the calculation says and what you actually observe in the real world? And one of the things this tells me is that, uh, you know, some of the um, threats about low pH in the oceans that might accompany global warming may be overstated. You know, uh, fishes are not going to be too upset at all by pHs that are anywhere above 7. And it's going to take a lot of CO2 to bring the pH down anywhere close to 7. But corals and other critters may be very different, may be much more sensitive. And I think that's where the arguments are focused is that only a few tenths of a pH unit down from the nominal 8.4 could be a serious situation. So some of you may have knowledge or opinions about that. Uh, that we'd, we'd like to hear about. Um, I'm going to take a little bit more time here. I'm not sure what our what is our end time. Does anybody know? Is it 25? 25? Okay, 25 after. So we'll maybe 35. We'll just do a couple more here. I think that's going to get us pretty close to the end. Suspended solids um, make the water muddy or turbid, they don't uh, uh, contribute to the chemistry so much directly. Uh, and they do, are important of course, in that they reduce light penetration. And that means less light for photosynthesis and it also means less light for uh, animals that depend on vision. So turbid water is going to be uh, water where you expect uh, fishes that depend more on other senses maybe than vision to live. Light, uh, we've talked about already, really important for photosynthesis and for vision. Both the quality and the quantity of light change as you go down in the water column. And forget... Um, you know, anything else, think of the purest <coughs> tropical seas, the clearest tropical seas, 55% of the total incident light becomes heat uh, within the upper meter. So by the time you're one meter down in the water column, you've lost 55% of the light as light, and it's become heat. Um, as you go down in the water, the middle wavelengths uh, of the spectrum tend to penetrate better so you have a greater proportion of those still left than you have of either the longer wavelengths toward the red end of the spectrum or the shorter wavelengths toward the violet, ultraviolet. Does everybody remember that old acronym from the 8th grade, Roy B. Jiv, or whatever it is? Red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo. I've already forgotten. What is it next? I forgot something there. Roy G. Roy G. Green. Indigo. No, green. Blue. Blue. Indigo violet. Indigo violet. And then ultraviolet. Okay, thank you. So anyhow, the middle part of the spectrum goes deeper than the, than the two extremes. Some really important stuff here, and I don't know if we have time to do justice to this, having to do with thermal properties of water. Um... I don't think we do have enough time. We've got a lab coming up, so I'm going to stop, And even though I hope that we would. I just can't get to Stella and talk about it much and then finish things on a timely basis, it looks like. But I don't want to, I don't want to sell this part short having to do with temperature effects and temperature thermal and heat properties, so I think we'll quit there and pick it up again uh, next time on Thursday, wrap that up, and move on to feeds and feeding. Uh, today in lab, we're going to be anticipating by talking about, you know, doing experiments that have to do with feeds and feeding. We're jumping ahead here. So I will see you all back uh, here in the room, I hope, at 2.